Hey everybody! Welcome to Let's Look at Renowned Explorers International Society. This is the newest game from Abbey Games. You may know them from their last game. It came out, uh, like January of 2013, April of 2013. It was called Reyes Royce. It was basically, uh, it took place, you played the role of basically, uh, elemental gods on a circular planet and you walked around and kind of terraformed it uh, in order to create certain kind of biomes and environments in order to make your villagers happy or you know adjust their moods in certain ways it was an interesting game that I actually uh, I kind of liked it and it showed up in a lot of humble bundles and stuff like that so I think that it's a, an interesting point of reference for this game um, renowned explorers on the other hand which just came out on Steam, and it is uh, 22 Canadian, so 20 American uh, dollars, that is. Uh, not, you know, pints of milk or something like that. Is uh, a game that's a little bit of a mix of FTL combined with tactical squad-based combat. So a little bit of like FTL meets XCOM with the aesthetic or the tone of something like an Indiana Jones movie. So uh, it also has a little bit of 80 Days mixed up in there. You know, the, uh, the game where you kind of trotted along the globe and you had a little bit of a choose your own adventure style going on there. It's got a lot of that nice light, uh, lighthearted tone going on. Really kind of deep systems, sometimes almost uh, aggressively if I may say so myself, but it's a game that's very playable. I've played about two hours of it so far, having a pretty good time with it and I'm a sucker for these kinds of games which makes me a little bit of a, a softball critic but also a little bit of a harsh critic sometimes because I've seen a lot of games that have done stuff like this very well, but uh, I think Renowned Explorers is mostly successful. So I'll explain what's going on here. Uh, I believe that it's meant to be played in kind of the same way that you would play like a lunch break roguelite kind of game. One to two hour long sessions uh, in adventure mode at least. I haven't done discovery mode. Discovery mode kind of seems like uh, not to be dismissive, but casual mode. You, when you lose, you can retry, you can save and load whenever you want, etc, etc. Uh, adventure mode is the more difficult one, it carries more, like, permanent consequences. Uh, so we're gonna take that and then select our crew. And crew selection is actually really important. There's four classes in the game. Uh, scientist, scout, fighter, and speaker. Now, scientists, they get extra research for completing challenges. Scout, get extra gold when completing challenges. Fighters get extra gold as well. Uh, and speakers gain extra status, but usually scouts are a little weaker, but they'll have ranged combat or they'll have uh, extra moves when they're in combat. Whereas fighters are usually a little, uh, they have lower movement points or lower movement range, but they, uh, they hit harder. So the thing that's interesting is you have a captain and then two crew members, and you can only choose from a very limited set of, or limited subset, I should say, of your uh, adventurers here until you play a little bit more. So I have to complete a few more expeditions with uh, all these characters to unlock them as captain. I believe the captain maybe gets uh, a, a small bonus when it comes to their roles or something in the game. Not for combat, but for like uh, skill checks basically. But we'll roll like a... Um, I just unlocked Charles Temple Templeton as our leader. So let's try him as our leader. Ex-sailor and then ex-butler from Manchester. Who wants to rub elbows with the queen? Knows how to throw a punch and an insult. So we'll make him our, uh, our captain here. And as our captain... Oh, he gives us a perk. That's what it is. We get plus one campaign whenever we enter an area with a wits challenge. I'll talk about about what's going on with that. What's also cool is that not only do all these players have their own unique play style, but the game actually does a really good job of kind of telling you what that character is good at and who to pair them with. So Charles is a defensive speaker with great defenses and overall good offense. That seems good to me. He can force enemies to attack him with a group insult. Charles does especially well in devious crews, but is a balanced addition to most teams. Recommended crew go aggressive or devious with Dolores and Haddis. So uh, Dolores, I believe, is this, yeah, she is this, uh, like, luchador here. She's a defensive fighter with great armor and decent offenses. With either hitting or shouting, Dolores can keep opponents busy and take their hits. Dolores does well in most aggressive and devious crews. And then for our final crew member, we'll take Haddis, which I believe is, uh, a scout? Yeah, Haddis Ataman. A glass cannon scout with amazing attack and speech, but very lacking defenses. Haddis can hit all opponents in a single line with her bow and arrow. She does great in aggressive and devious crews as long as there's someone there to protect her. Awesome. So we have, uh, we have a full crew here with a scout, a fighter, and a speaker. We won't be able to take a scientist with us, and as a result, we'll probably suffer in research here. But that's okay. And we'll get this nice little visual splash here when we get started. And one of the big strengths of the game, for sure, is definitely uh, the art style. It has a really nice kind of like... I don't know if it's proper to say cell shaded, but I think you know what I mean. Like, it's got a nice kind of like a hand-drawn aesthetic, like a very colorful, cartoony, but not cheap aesthetic. Like, it looks like a, like a high-quality cartoon. Uh, there's not that much in the way of animations once you get into the game. A lot of it takes place on this screen right here. Another game that you might think of as a reasonable analog for this would be something like The Yogg, where it's like a choose-your-own-adventure. And actually, visually, they, they're not that dissimilar. So we're just going to say time for adventure. Keep in mind there is going to be a lot of reading as we get going here, but basically the way that the uh, the game gets started, you have five expeditions that you do. The first one is kind of like a tutorial expedition. So 
Uh, which will be good for us, because we'll get a chance to kind of teach each other about how things go here. But there's some important stuff to talk about before we get started. Uh, this is your resolve. Every time a crew member gets defeated, or sometimes when you like... I think maybe it's only when crew members get defeated now that I think about it. But there are some uh, like choose your own adventure conditions where you can lose resolve as well. If your resolve falls to zero, your campaign fails. Not just this expedition right here. Your campaign consisting of multiple adventures will fail and you'll basically perma-die and have to restart another one. Celtic Code is basically the quest that we're on right now. And our supplies are right here, 7 out of 7. Every time we move, it will cost us uh, some amount of supplies to move. Uh, right now, I think on the first level it'll all be one, but once we get into harsher environments, it could be, you know, two. I've never seen three, but I, I don't know yet. Now, every turn, for lack of a better word, you do get the ability to choose where you want to go. So we can go here. Unexplored, cost one supply. You can gain status, you can gain gold, and there might be an encounter. Or we could go here. Uh, there's a nature challenge. An athlete, a survivalist, or a naturalist may be useful, and there's research to be found here. Well, do we have an athlete, a naturalist, or a survivalist? Uh, Haddis is a quick thinker. Dolores is an athlete, but only level one. Your characters do get experience as time goes on. Like I said, there's a lot of interlocking systems here. Not just the perks and the traits, but also there's training as you level up. And we have a survivalist level one with cooking. So I say we go for this challenge right here uh, and and try to gain uh, whatever we're going to get for, for the athlete or survivalist winning this. Uh, the crew is walking through the forest quietly when they hear the bushes rumble. The crew sneaks up to see what's causing all that noise. Get closer. A white stag. What a fascinating sight. Not only is this an invaluable observation, so this is indicating that there's like research to be gained, but the stories to come from this will impress the renowned explorers. Dolores, who's getting a little hungry, wonders how a white stag would taste, which Haddis finds a little cruel. But we gain two study and two campaign as a result of that. Now we get tokens. So we didn't actually have the chance to like do a dice roll there, but we will as the game goes on. Um, we get two tokens. Tokens basically are artifacts that when we take back to our laboratory or our headquarters back in the continental Europe, uh, I think it's in London, which is technically not continental Europe, but you, you know what I mean. Um, they get converted into research points. We use the research points to unlock new perks and stuff like that. Um, campaign tokens, campaign tokens I should say, get converted back to status, uh, which allows us to attract an entourage and get other various benefits. We'll also have like encounter tokens, which give us gold, and then uh, there's some other tokens. You'll see them as we get going here. Uh, what about this one? There's research to be found here. One supply cost, obviously. Treasure may be present. There might be an encounter. This one is just research. This one is an encounter and status. This one is just research. So let's try to get the treasure here. We have a little bit of time to kind of float around because there is an element of resource management when it comes to your supplies, obviously. Um, we want to get as much as we possibly can without ever running out of supplies. If you run out of supplies, people start to take on negative traits that are persistent for them. Uh, so it's kind of got like a little Darkest Dungeon thing going on as well. This is a really like Jack of All Trades things here. Your crew is minding its own business, walking around the forest and taking samples for research when you suddenly hear the sound of multiple feet rushing towards you. That did give us a research token, though. Get off my land! A man followed by wolves is charging at you aggressively. Let's defend ourselves. This is perfect timing, because we're getting a nice gentle lead-in to a lot of the systems that are happening in the game. So, as mentioned, um, this is also, like, half xcom uh, which is just a reasonable analog. It doesn't actually play that much like XCOM. It plays a little bit more like something like Massive Chalice or something like that. But it's a, um, it's a turn-based, squad-based tactical game as well. You don't have to fight that much if you don't want to, but it is a, a pretty integral element of the game. You could avoid encounters at least until the boss fights. There's also a mood system, or an attitude system in the game, and a mood system. I, I know, it, it takes a lot to wrap your head around sometimes, but um, basically we can approach the fight as a, a, a friendly attitude, with a devious attitude, or as an aggressive attitude, and these will all carry benefits or ne uh, penalties associated with them. If we resolve this aggressively, the druid is knocked out and we continue. If we resolve it deviously, the druid accidentally tells us about a treasure and we get two research tokens. If we resolve it friendly, the druid helps you find a treasure and we get four tokens. So if possible, we're going to try to resolve this in a friendly fashion. This is where things are going to start to get a little complicated. And if I may be like 100% honest here, one of the things that has kind of uh, turned me off of the game a little bit, even though I mostly like it, is just there's a lot of complex stuff happening here. There's the mood system. Um, which is basically the way your player feels. This is not friendly, aggressive, devious. This is like terrified, scared, enraged, flattered, etc, etc, which we'll see later. Then there's the mood system for the fights. Then there's like the, the actual damage and defense that you do in the fights. Then there's the, you know, campaign tokens, which there's four different kinds of. Those tokens get converted to other resources. It's almost a little bit overwhelming, and I, I think I would have preferred from a design standpoint if they had 
focused in on something that was maybe not as wide, but a little bit more deep, I guess. Because right now this feels like a lot of interlocking systems, which work, but are like a little... Each one maybe doesn't have quite the same level of strategy as if they just gone deep on like, oh, let's let's make this a game that's like 80% about dealing with morale, 20% about attacking. Instead, there's like a lot of, of different things to focus on at any given time. But anyway, we're going to try to resolve this fight from a uh, friendly standpoint. Every character has three different attacks to start with. One of them is friendly, one of them is uh, devious, which is terrify here, and one of them is uh, aggressive. And basically, our dominance, or the majority of our attacks, whatever their attitude is, that is going to be what the vibe of the fight is going to be. So right now, it's just uncertain. Uh, but I'll try to be friendly, and we're going to try to defeat this boss, uh, because that's our objective. We don't actually have to defeat all the wolves if we don't have to. So let's start with, uh, let's start with Haddis here, and we're going to move her over here with one action. You get two actions per turn. And then we'll have her use Try to Encourage. And this is one of the things that's very difficult to wrap your head around, is moves like Try to Encourage, it's friendly, right? And it gives you the power of 80% uh, times, or she, her power is 80% times her speech stat. Um, but it actually does hurt enemies if you use it on them. And this is another thing that I think is a little weird. Things like, you know, impress someone. It, it works against your enemy's HP. You can also use it to buff yourself, but it's kind of like the way that they conceptualize it is like you're breaking an enemy's will by making them so happy and like so impressed or so flattered they don't want to fight you anymore because you kind of like converted them over to your side but i think it's a little bit of a, a loosely working system and it's very confusing when you first get started out and you're like how can i resolve conflicts in a friendly way when literally like everything i do does damage you, you just have to figure out that friendly doesn't always mean friendly so anyway we're going to use try to encourage here 80 percent chance to hit it fumbled, which means it did not work. But we've created a friendly vibe. But because we're friendly and our opponent is aggressive, um, that means that we get a debuff. All crew members are shocked at this indignity, basically, and they get minus 30 armor, which is really, really bad. But we should still be able to get out of this. So we're going to try to impress this guy again, basically. <laughs> this is a cool system, actually, that um, there's a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors mechanic going on here. If your enemy is aggressive and you're devious, you'll do better. But if your enemy is friendly and you're aggressive, their devious will be better as well. And there's different kind of like buffs and debuffs that happen for each one. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to do too much here. Maybe we can flatter our teammate. And um, yeah, we'll make our teammate a little bit better on the next turn. And we'll end our turn and see what happens. But uh, that first fumble was not really a good situation for us. And the fact that our armor is going to be so low uh, will mean that it's possible that some of our units might die on this. Maybe not this turn, maybe next turn. Uh, and if they die, obviously we'll lose Renown. Or not Renown, sorry, we'll lose Insight. Not insight. <laughs> Resolve, that's it. See, this is like, there we go. It, it, if I just waited, it would have told me. But um, just a little bit too many interlocking systems here. And uh, I find myself getting confused a lot of the time just because there's there's so, so much going on. Man, we are actually going to be in a really terrible spot. We might have to restart this uh, before this first one is even over. There's no, like, runaway mechanic or anything like that. Uh, we could resurrect. Oh, no, we can't get behind. Jeez. Uh tell you what we'll use terrify this won't change our attitude for the fight yet and it'll lower the his morale and then um with dolores here can we land a flattery no we cannot and we can't really move anywhere that's going to make our life easier so um i think maybe we'll try to encourage our friend yeah, it's not particularly strong, but at least he might be able to live through this turn. Although, if Dolores dies, we're going to run out of resolve anyway. This is kind of an uncharacteristic um, first adventure. This is, Again, this is my third or fourth time actually starting one. This is the first time I'm going to lose on the first mission, but uh, I guess that shows me for trying to take a little bit more of a friendly approach. Although, it does seem like the AI is kind of being a little kinder now and being like, okay, we're just going to move around. Don't kill them during the tutorial mission. Um, but, you know, it just goes to show you again that this is another kind of game where uh, if, if you hate games where the AI can dictate whether or not you succeed, you, uh, it happens in this. Let's just put it that way. Um, not the AI, sorry. Did I say AI? I meant RNG. Can I back up one and still hit with try to impress? Range is two tiles. Certainly hope so. I can, I can still hit with it. All right. So, I'm thinking we throw Dolores in here. Dolores. And then we have her do a Terrify, which will, you can see by the meter up at the top, that this actually would not um, change the attitude. When that bar fills up, it'll change your attitude to Devious. 
But um, we'll just try to impress here. 80% chance we win, 20% chance we lose forever. All right, we should have beaten the boss there. We've resolved the mission, and we resolved it in a friendly way, which was much harder on us, as you saw, and we ended up losing some resolve in the process. Uh, but we also picked up six tokens, six campaign tokens, which are going to be worth a lot of value when we get back to our headquarters. And uh, Dolores now also gets uh, a little bit of a buff for this exp expedition. Plus, we're going to get the treasure from this druid now. The druid apologizes. I thought you were going to steal everything I have, but it turns out you're pretty nice. You can have this treasure I was guarding. We got the Celtic Cross. Temporary invincibility. No, it's obviously Isaac. Um, but not everybody watching this might know about Rebirth. So, plus two research from study uh, and six campaign tokens. That's pretty good. And these are basically passive things that'll stick with us. Our goal is to... Um, we want to become the most renowned explorer in the world. Our goal is not to kill, like, some demon boss or something like that. Basically, these explorers, they're very petty, petty people, and they have infighting with one another. We want to create the most renowned group of explorers, and we'll meet our main nemesis as we get started here, or as we get going. Um, maybe we still have five supplies, so let's just do some, like, simple stuff to gain more tokens here. Um, it said, like, a naturalist might be good here. You hear some rumbling in the bushes again? Haddis gets up close to inspect it. It's the white stag again. As soon as it spots you, it flees at top speed. Charles wonders whether he should follow the white stag or just collect samples and make up an impressive story. So this is where kind of like the dice roll and the character traits kind of come into it. Uh, again, there's just so many systems at play here, which is Im both impressive and overwhelming. Um, you can see uh, our our odds to make this work. So what are what makes up basically the the odds here? I think it's based on well, you can see it there. 10% from his base chance, 22% from his speech defense which is something that we can augment with equipment. 3% from Grit, plus 20% from Survivalist. So he gets a big bonus because he has the Survivalist trait. Similarly, um, Dolores... Oh, I thought Dolores was like a naturalist. Maybe that would help. But anyway, we're going to use just the one with the highest percentage chance here. And that is going to fail. Usually, on failing, you don't seem to get negative consequences unless you're in like a really, really dire situation. Mostly, you just don't get the positive uh, experience out of it. Okay, travel costs one supplies, wits challenge, a tactician, beguiler, or quick thinker may be useful, which is great for us because Haddis is a level two quick thinker. Um, research and gold and something odd here. So there are some storylines and stuff like that. Oh my God, I just realized I'm almost out of resources and I might have moved too far away. But anyway, we'll get to see the negative penalty of that. All right, an elusive gold bird. These babies are worth a ton to traders. Sadly, the bird seems to know that it's very desirable and makes to fly away. The crew already feels disappointed at this missed opportunity when someone's unpredictable instincts kick in. Okay, Haddis cannot let so much money fly away and does something unpredictable. The bird is worth a small fortune. Haddis' greed takes over and in a blind rush, Haddis manages to snatch the little fellow. While Haddis allows the crew to research it, Haddis wants to keep the profits. Haddis' greed can make for unpredictable actions. So we get um, five study and she gained a, tra a trait there. A little bit of a darkest dungeon uh, thing going on. We also have a level up for Charles Templeton. And basically this just allows you to cho uh, choose uh, a new perk. Sometimes it'll be like a new combat uh, option. Or the new combat option just shows up no matter which one you take. But you, you get perks that change, you know, whether you get an extra level in Diplomat or an extra level in Survivalist. And I think we'll take an extra level in Diplomat because I, I like playing like high charisma characters. So he gets etiquette. Now... We actually can make it to the exit here before running out of supplies, which is good. And at the exit, there's almost always a boss encounter that you're going to have to resolve with combat. Even though I said you can avoid combat sometimes, what I meant was you, you can avoid uh, encounters on the map because you can see where most of them are. But you usually have a, a, a bit of a, a, a boss battle at the end anyway. And some of them can actually be pretty difficult. The Druidic Circle must be somewhere around. Once you get there, this expedition will come to an end. You can come back to this place when you wish to continue later. Are you ready to go? Yes. This basically is like, this is the point of no return for where we are right now. The crew vigorously searches through the dense forest. It doesn't take long before you find it. A standing stone circle. The ruined main menhir must contain valuable information to study. It will surely skyrocket your reputation at the renowned explorers. However, you hear familiar laughter. Behind you stands the French explorer Rivaleux, who is considered to be the most promising of the renowned explorers. He got here just before you did. Thank you, amateur. Under rule 24B of the explorer mandate, fellow explorers should help each other out. And I really need to take the main men here to impress a lady. Rivolo looks amused. Ah, please, explorer. We both know that this treasure is better off in my hands. Allow my sharp companion, Amir Akhtar, or Akhtar, to explain it to you in clearer words. Basically, uh, every time you encounter this guy, you have to fight one member of his crew. Sometimes it's his, uh, his speaker. Sometimes it's his fighter, etc., etc. So let's see here. 
Uh, if we beat him aggressively, he's mildly impressed. If we beat him friendly, he thinks we're weak. If we beat him devious, he admires our sharpness, which is actually great for us because I think we're best off as a, uh, as a devious approach here. We just got a new ability, so there are area of effect abilities as well. It's a pretty light strategy game, which is not to say that the tactics required are that you don't have to be intelligent to do it, but, um... Like, there's not that many, like, interactions from stuff that I've seen so far, but there are, like, area of effect ones. Like, Group Insult here will hit all enemies in an area of effect, and uh, it works as a, a devious move. It also makes them enraged, which I think makes them more likely to target us, which is good because our defense is high. So we've gone devious versus devious here, which means that friendly abilities actually get more power. There's a little bit of, like, a prisoner's dilemma thing going on there. Um, we'll go up front here, and maybe, probably should have gone for that one, but do some uh, physical damage. I don't want to do friendly attacks because she's not a very friendly person. She's a fighter. I think that's the way that we should be approaching it, at least. And then we'll have uh, Haddis come up here, and let's see. We can see the, the preview of the damage. That's actually a ton of damage to do to the boss here, and all we have to do is defeat the boss. So uh, I think that this is going to set us up nicely to maybe even win on the next turn. But now we've taken an aggressive approach to the battle, uh, which gives us lower speech defense. Basically, I guess the conceptualization here is that we've committed to being, like, really aggressive, so we're not going to, uh, we're not gonna have much, like, we're not gonna worry about what they say to us, I guess. If they're gonna threaten us, we're gonna take those threats more seriously. If they're gonna make fun of us, we're gonna take that at face value. Again, it's a little bit of a strange abstraction for combat, uh, but, you know, if you think about a lot of strategy games or RPGs, it would basically be like, your speech defense is this, you know, you pass the skill check, so you don't have to fight them. This this makes you get into combat for better or for worse. And most of the time, I'll admit that I think it is for worse. I think it's kind of a weaker game as a result of it. But uh, at the same time, it's it's uh, very, very playable. And I actually think it's a very strong game overall. It's just a little bit... The, the combat, with its weird mood and, and attitude systems, uh, leaves a little bit to be desired, I think. But But everything else in the game, I think, is very solid. Amir stops and stares at you. After some silence, he says, You're strong! Mildly impressive, my friend. He drops some research notes to you as some form of acknowledgement, then leaves to follow Rivelu, who somehow managed to get away with the whole stone. We got one study token for that, and, uh... Oh, sweet. Amazing, I saw how you handled that encounter. Your strength showed in that fierce battle. I'm honored that someone like you was looking at our history. Allow me to help you with a divination. Please tell me, what is the dream you chase? And our leader says, That everyone will adore me. Ah, fame, of course. I know a Celtic burial site with items to bedazzle the world. The druid leads his crew and suddenly stops to tell the crew to start digging. The crew finds popular truffles and a unique treasure. So we get another treasure that'll help us out here. The treasure gives us renown, which is what is used for the rankings of the, um, of the researchers, or sorry, of the explorers. And we also get uh, an extra uh, passive bonus here as well. Excellent, back to London. So that is pretty much uh, one mission in Renowned Explorers. I don't think I'm gonna do one more mission. But I will show you what happens in the, the quote-unquote base building part of the game as we go through our uh, our end game screen here. So, uh, again, let me explain what we got here. Two treasures. These treasures will give us um, some passive bonuses. They also have a rank associated with them. So you can see, you know, two rank B treasures, that's not so bad. We got 73 gold, which you can use to buy new equipment. 221 status is actually a ton. We can use that to uh, get new people in our entourage, which is not new playable characters, but other people that'll give us passive benefits. It's basically like, there's a lot of compound interest kind of stuff going on here. Research we can use to write research papers. You do that over the course of a mission, and it unlocks stuff like, you start your next mission with plus one tool, or something like that. And then Renown is our ranking that we use to uh, basically win the game. So let's continue here. And you can see right now we rank uh, ninth in the world with 148 renown. Not particularly good. We only have five missions, and in that amount of time, we've got to get over 2,000. Otherwise, uh, we will lose the game. And I have not won the game yet, but I have uh, I've completed a campaign uh, without dying, which was fantastic. But uh, <laughs> I have, I've never managed to get over 2,000. So they're actually, it's not, even though it maybe has a little bit more of a... a child-friendly look to it than something like FTL, that doesn't mean it's necessarily any easier. I mean, FTL is maybe not the best comparison because that game is actually hard as hell, but um, it, it it's not a game that you're just going to win probably your first time anyway. Uh, ignore this stuff, basically. This is tutorialization. Um, oh, we can also write research papers back at our base. I didn't know that. So, the first thing I like to do is basically you have um, insight that you gain from being on your campaign. We can use our insight to speak and you'll see the reward that we get here. If we speak like this, we get uh, some extra, 
I think that's just gonna be gold. Basically, they were like a mercenary lecturer here. So we use two tokens, we get 21 gold out of that. We could also spend our, um, our insight speaking for status, and then this gave us 26 status, which again will allow us to recruit more people. Or we could spend it, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I was gonna say we could spend it, uh, speaking uh, at universities, which will give us more research, but we don't have any scientists anyway, so we weren't gonna have very functional, uh, lecturers for that, probably. Then, you probably would like to, uh, spend all your resources. So we'll start with our status, because we have a lot of it. Status is primarily used to unlock, uh, your entourage. So we can have specialists that give us passive abilities, like for example, um, gain an extra one collect if you resolve a counter friendly, or gain an extra one campaign if you resolve a counter regressive, stuff like that. But uh, I'm, I'm mostly going to be devious, I think, so I don't really want to spend on them, but we could use 50 status to get the second level of specialists, and then we could maybe get something useful here, although we can't afford any of these anymore. So let's pick up some helpers. I think we're going to need some students, uh, because we don't have any scientists on our crew. And maybe we'll get, um, extra gold doesn't hurt either. We'll take some extra gold there. Uh, and then we've spent our status. Let's spend our gold. Uh, gold, you usually just go to the store and you'll be like, okay, everybody's got three equipment slots. What should I buy here? With only 94 gold, honestly, there's not that much for us to pick up. But we could pick up maybe, uh, decent armor plus 10 armor. And if we buy that and uh, maybe outfit that on our fighter, who's gonna be more in uh, close combat than anybody else. They'll have much greater defense now. We can sell this back for five, which is obviously not that much, but if we sell another leather vest back for five, we could buy some more decent armor and then put that up there. So we've spent all our gold, but we've really upgraded the defense of our, uh, of our squad here. And then finally, research. Uh, that's just writing research papers, which I have to go back for. Uh, you write research papers, so let's unlock uh, preparation, which cost us like 10 research. Next one costs 20. Start every expedition with one extra tool, which can be used to improve your chances on the adventure wheel, so that slot machine thing that you saw, or gain one insight every time you finish an expedition. That seems good, so I'll take that. Next one, 30 research. Upgrading shops in Entourage Hall costs minus 40% status. Well, considering that I am an idiot and already upgraded my uh, Entourage Hall, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do tools of the trade, and then maybe um, you gain two supply capacity. Oh, we, we can't afford it. We're four short. All right, well, that's uh, the next thing you would do here is just choose another mission. I have seen a lot of them. Like, I've, I've already done Irish Isles, obviously. I've done Hungarian Fort. I've done Caribbean Island. I think another thing that would be awesome for the game is if there's a little bit more of a, an adventure influx. Oh, we have new levels to come here, too. Like, if, if there were more locations for adventures and more adventures to choose from, that would be positive. Um, let's go all the way. Actually, you know what? Let's, let's branch out. Let's get uh, piloting, which allows us... To be a little bit more diversified without being super strong necessarily in Quick Thinker alone. And then we'll get, uh, we already have a good Quick Thinker, so let's get another athlete perk so that uh, we'll be more likely to pass challenges like that in the future. So that's, um, that's Renowned Explorers. I forgot the second part of the, the title, but uh, would I recommend it? Yeah, absolutely. I could see myself getting a few hours of enjoyment out of this without a doubt. The combat system, I find myself a little bit wishy-washy on, but I really like everything else that the game is wrapped in. You know, the light strategy elements, the light character customization and building, and uh, the control you have over kind of the direction of your expeditions by using your status and your research and, and whatnot. Uh, I think it's a really engaging game and it mostly succeeds at doing what it, uh, what it sets out to do. Will it be the next FTL? Will it be the next, you know, Rogue Legacy or something like that? Not that it necessarily aspires to be Rogue Legacy. No, I, I don't think so. I think a better game to compare it to, again, might be XCOM. I think the combat is just a little bit too, you know, so-so to be on the strategic level of depth that XCOM is on. But it, it does fit as kind of like a casual combat element in a game like this. And uh, I think this is one of the stronger games of this type that I've played so far this year. So, again, is 20 bucks American on uh, on Steam if you're interested in picking it up. There will be a video description or a link in the video description to pick it up if you're interested. And uh, even if you're not, I hope you enjoyed the episode. And maybe you'll uh, take a look at it at a later date. For now, uh, if you enjoyed it, click the like button. It helps out a great deal. And, of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. But for now, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. when I can find the stop recording button.